this year's uh, online summit, we thought, well, maybe we should talk to Sarah and see if she might be interested in saying something about how to dif differentiate your food tour. So um, Sarah, without further ado, why don't I turn it over to you? Great, thanks so much, Eric. Um, and hello to everyone uh, who's joining this call. Um, I may have had the opportunity to meet some of you um, when my husband and I were at the Food Trucks Innovation Summit in uh, November um, in London. And so hello to all of you. And uh, to those of you I've not met, I look forward to um, meeting you throughout this online summit. Uh, and yeah, just getting a chance to, you know, share in some best practices through the different sessions. Um, so as Eric mentioned, um, I was asked to speak on the topic of how to differentiate your food tour. Um, so before I begin there, um, I thought I'd start with a little bit of background on uh, my husband and I, uh, Bryce, who started this business. Um, so my husband Bryce and I, we met in graduate school in public policy, um, and we've worked in a wide variety of sectors from local government to education, social services, uh, environmental conservation, economic development, and we both have a strong love of food. And we really saw that the main food system had its tendrils in all of these areas of community development. Um, admittedly, we did not come at this uh, with the idea that we wanted to do a food tour for its own sake, uh, but rather we saw um, the main food system as having so many rich narratives um, and then ultimately found that a food tour would be a wonderful vehicle to really shine a light on all those uh, who contribute to a sustainable food system in Maine. Uh, so when we launched our business, our mission is to reveal the distinctive stories of Maine's unique food system and the social, economic, and environmental underpinnings. And really our vision uh, is a future where people feel an intimate connection to their food decisions and a sense of responsibility for the sustainable relationships their food has within their communities. Um, so to do that, uh, we really saw ourselves as serving as the nexus point between all the intellectual capital that exists in Maine's food system um, and with the general public. So I just want to start with a little bit of um, kind of the model of our business. Um, so a little bit about Maine and Portland's restaurant scene. Um, in 2019, Bon Appetit named Portland its restaurant city of the year. Um, that was very lucky for us because that was the first year we started running our tours. Uh, so that was a great uh, article to come out that year. Um, but Portland just has 67,000 residents, yet we have 418 restaurants and we're a state with just 1.3 million um, in terms of population, but we receive 37 million visitors annually. Um, so we are definitely seen as a food town, as a food state, um, and so our tour is really responding to an audience that's much larger than our local population. Um, so when we looked at our model, we first wanted to partner with restaurants that were committed to sourcing and harvesting local sustainable food. That's really part of the value proposition of the business that we wanted um, to start. And admittedly, when we started this, uh, we knew that people wouldn't know us as, you know, business owners and uh, people in this field of, of food tourism and hospitality. So we also really wanted to select restaurants that were viewed as, you know, world class uh, that uh, really had committed to sourcing local sustainable food. So that was part of the selection process there. Um, we also, because we want to show the importance of the entire food chain and shine a light on that, um, we are partnered with about a little over 50 growers, harvesters, and nonprofit research and education leaders in food. So as an example, which is a little hard to see, I'll hold up here, but this is one of our tour brochures from our signature Land Sea to Fork tour. And you can see that on the tour, I'll kind of try to hold this up here on this brochure, um, that we showcase all the farms and fisheries um, that have contributed ingredients to the tastings that are on our tour. And then we also uh, demonstrate 
that I'm doing a bad job of holding this up here, but um, while we are based uh, down here in Portland, um, that the tastings come from all across the state. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, partner with leaders in the food sector from research, education, nonprofit organizations. They're really the ones that we meet with on a continual basis to make sure that we're relaying um, the correct information, the data, the science, uh, the history of these sectors. Um, and they're also a great resource for us if we ever uh, you know, receive questions from guests in terms of follow-up. Um, but you know, a lot of these entities, you know, they can't really tell. Uh, their stories. You know, producers and fishers are sometimes very invisible uh, to the consumer. And so we make sure that we meet with all of them. We incorporate their stories. We hear their, their challenges, their innovations. So we really relay that, um, you know, to all of the guests on our tour. And even restaurants, um, their menu can't tell that story. Um, their wait staff can't always tell the story in the limited time that people are exposed to their restaurants. And we really want to celebrate those restaurants that in so many ways really go beyond their bottom line to source local sustainable food and really support that whole food chain um, across our state. Um, so in our model, we are partnered, uh, basically our tours are close to three hours. Um, depending on the tour, we go to five or six restaurants. Uh, we have another tour that's a little bit shorter in duration that goes to four stops and has drink pairings that really showcase Maine's agricultural products, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, but basically each stop is a chapter in revealing uh, the main food system. So you're going to learn a lot about our heritage industries in, of agriculture, commercial fishing, also emerging areas in aquaculture, the importance and virtues of eating local and sustainable seafood and in general eating uh, with what's in season uh, from the land and the sea. But we also get into larger macro food issues. Uh, we cover topics that are on any person's mind that comes to our state. While we reveal them through the lens of Maine, they're on people's mind throughout the globe. We talk about climate change, ocean acidification, uh, food insecurity, food waste, uh, rural urban dynamics, um, industries that have had to adapt due to market forces and environmental changes. And so all of this ties together for someone who takes our tour in a three hour experience where you can say, I've visited these restaurants that I've read about and are on my list. And I've had local sustainable uh, food that really showcases Maine. And I've learned about one of Maine's uh, sectors in terms of food, which is one of our largest employment sectors in the state, and that people really walk away and say, I really do understand Maine. I now understand why it's on the map uh, for food and a, and a celebrated food destination. Um, I think that when we get into looking at that kind of macro level content uh, that we cover, you know, a meal is such a social activity. It's an emotional activity. It's social. It puts us at ease in a relaxed state. And I think that that really provides us that vehicle to really talk about um, this type of content that may not always uh, be as easily digestible in a lecture format. You know, if you're just going to a lecture on climate change, for example, you know, I think when you're eating the food, when you're understanding um, different place-based geographic advantages that Maine has, its challenges, you know, you're able to really take in that information in a way that maybe you wouldn't um, in another setting. I think too, uh, we're not afraid to show that gritty underbelly of Maine. Um, again, as I mentioned, you know, we don't just paint these kind of rose colored glass over uh, Maine. We, you know, we talk about Maine's advantages, but we also talk about its challenges. Uh, but when we talk about challenges, we talk about innovation um, that has occurred as well. Uh, because, you know, I think as Eric mentioned at the start of 
uh, this session, you know, authenticity is what tr culinary travelers are expecting. And we want to make sure that we are showing um, the authentic Maine when you take our tour. Um, and as I mentioned, my husband Bryce and I, we've, we've worked in the nonprofit sector, um, but in some ways, uh, doing this type of business uh, through the lens of hospitality and tourism allows us to connect to new audiences and expose this content to new people. And it's fantastic to see, you know, the light bulbs going off with the general public. So I just thought um, we last year did a little video, which is um, kind of a promotion of our tours. And I thought I would share my screen here. Hopefully this goes easier than I think. I guess I'm desktop one, I'm gonna hope. Let me know if you need help. Sure. <laughs> Let's see here real quick. And if I can't get this up, it's on the homepage of our website. So, but I'm hoping I can. Okay. Sorry for the delay here, folks. I'm there now on the homepage of your yeah. website. Yeah, how about, would you like to show it, Eric? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Let me do that. Let's see, here we go. Share computer sound, optimize, boom. Okay, this video here, Sarah? Yes. Okay. Sorry, if that bar is there, I can send you the exact link, which would link out to our... Have you ever thought about where you come from? from? Not just the town, the state, or the country, but the hands that actually picked those greens. The line that actually caught that fish. The person whose entire livelihood depends on those potatoes. Have you thought about the virtues of eating locally sourced and sustainable food? Have you thought about how climate change is impacting seafood harvesting? Or how food insecurity may be affecting your city or neighborhood? On a main Food for Thought tour, we look forward to shining a light on the ingenuity, adaptability, and grit of those that work tirelessly on behalf of the main food sector to better the health of local economies, ecosystems, and communities. Based in Portland, Maine, Bon Appetit's Restaurant City of the Year, we partner with restaurants that have gone beyond their bottom line to provide local and sustainably sourced food, as well as growers and harvesters and thought leaders to help us tell the story of the Maine food system. This is important to us. Is it important to you? Join us. Book your tickets online for a Maine Food for Thought tour. Okay, I know that was incredibly difficult to listen to, so I have put the link uh, that goes actually directly uh, to where the video is housed in the chat. So you can copy that there. So I apologies. Think I know the narrator. The narrator sounds familiar. <laughs> you know what? It's actually, do you think it's me? It's yeah. actually not me. <laughs> oh, it sounds like you. I know, they uh, hired a person to do it, and I was like, wow, this, yeah, but, but it's not. <laughs> so. Yeah, so anyway, I shared that video for you to take a look at again. Sorry, technology just didn't quite work on that. Um, but I wanted to move a little bit into um, kind of the reception of, of the tour. Um, you know, we admittedly were not sure um, how a tour from this kind of educational perspective and promoting the values of local and sustainably sourced food would be received and would, you know, people really be interested in receiving this. Um, on vacation or as a local. Um, I know sometimes when I explain this, my, my probably public policy background comes through a little bit. It really is a fun and entertaining and engagement uh, experience. My husband gives a majority of the tours, so um, he does a fantastic job of that. Um, but, you know, we started off, um, I think, 
40th out of 40 for food and drink attractions on TripAdvisor when we launched. Um, and we were really excited that, you know, probably in 45 to 60 days, um, we quickly moved to that number one spot because of customer reviews. And what was so great when I went into the reviews was that it's always fantastic when you see reviews written in a way that if I were to write about the value of the tour and our brand, I feel like customers were really writing about that, that it was really equal on the food tastings and the education they were receiving and things that they would think about when they would go back to their own communities. Again, while we reveal this through the lens of Maine, uh, we definitely uh, give ideas and tips for people to think about when they return to um, wherever they are traveling from. So Eric asked me if I would maybe read, you know, just kind of one of the uh, customer comments on uh, one of the review sites. This one's from TripAdvisor, just to kind of give a sense. Um, so I will do that now. Um, it says, if you're wondering what makes this tour stand out from others, I would say the emphasis is largely educational. And I mean that in the best possible way. We are transitioning into a time when more people are curious and cognizant of where their food comes from, how it's prepared, where the waste goes, and these topics are addressed in this tour. The restaurants we visited not only serve high quality food, but they mindfully do so. And it was really encouraging and interesting to see how Maine's foodways have changed, how they've stayed the same over the years. I would definitely recommend this tour as a food lover and as a citizen of the world, which was a really nice review. Um, and, you know, we also are kind of, as I was mentioning, our nonprofit research education partners, you know, we refer to them as our content partners. As I mentioned, we vet all of our script content by them for accuracy. Um, we received a, you know, a testimonial from one entity that really focuses on restoring and diversifying fisheries uh, resources to help ecosystems, fishers, and coastal communities adapt to climate change. And uh, the woman who runs this division said, you know, a real challenge in their work is introducing consumers to new seafood products and really building the demand that will sustain a new fishery. And it was great that she sent a larger testimonial, but one sentence out of that is she said, central to the main food for thought experience is the sense of empowerment that participants gain. Food choices matter and demand starts with the consumer. You know, we serve things um, like skate at a stop on our tour or aquaculture grown mussels. And, you know, we have these conversations on uh, different ways to find out food, uh, I'm sorry, seafood that is, uh, you know, in more sort of sustainable uh, stocks within the region in which uh, they live. Uh, so I think, um, too, another thing is that the model has been great in terms of its open doors really early on to some national articles, which really helped us, um, you know, to build our brand and to attract people to take our tour. So an early investment we did was really in branding, making sure that we found a branding firm that really understood our mission. Um, and it was actually one that was really connected to a lot of hospitality and lifestyle brands uh, in our state. And then the other early investment we made was in a PR professional in Maine that also works um, in the hospitality industry. And so she really took that angle of um, visiting top restaurants that are on your list in under three hours um, and really the educational aspect of our tour. So um, an article that we were uh, profiled in with a number of different um, travel businesses was a New York Times article in 2018. And the title was Eating and Drinking Your Way Through a Trip and Learning Something in the Process. And the subheading was culinary travels on the rise, but it's not just food on the menu. Tours are offering deeper investigations into the cultural and geographic factors that surround what's on your plate. So that was key for us is to try to position ourselves in the marketplace um, on really learning something as well during the tour. And we've had um, other articles which have been really great in terms of um, driving you know, ticket sales and exposure to the business. Um, we were set, and I, I want to use this next example, I think this could be really applicable to a lot of people on this call. Um, 
Martha Stewart Living uh, was set to do an article, they've now tabled it um, in light of COVID-19 till later this fall, um, but it was set to come out in June. They were doing a food issue and they were gonna highlight three unique food tours. And they actually reached out to us um, and said, you know, what other travel tour companies would you recommend that are doing something similar? And I think that's something that we've always tried to do in the last couple of years. Um, I would encourage all of you to really be aware of what others in the industry are doing that are similar to your mission. Um, national and international publications, they're often looking to um, do a list of different options. And, you know, we really need to look to really elevate all of us in this experience. So for us, um, we recommended four. I would say a couple of those are um, food tour experiences that are World Food Travel Association members. Um, so I'm excited when I find out um, who actually ends up getting profiled in this. I'll definitely be reaching out to you because I think that it's it's really important again for us to, to all know that landscape and promote each other. Um, you know, we were looking at a new tour offering that would take people to the source of food. Um, one of the stops on our tour will be to an oyster farm. So we've started to investigate, you know, what are amazing oyster farm tours uh, in Maine? Because I think there are, again, ways to promote if this is something you really wanna do, here's one way to take it with our business, but here are other great avenues to do that as well. Um, I think too, we, it's been great that, that the educational piece of our tour um, has garnered some recognition. Uh, we were just absolutely thrilled to receive the World Food Travel Association um, Best Food, uh, I'm gonna get this right, Best Food or Beverage Tour experience last year. Um, again, that's, it was just so critical for us to be recognized uh, by our peers. Uh, and again, in terms of that educational focus, um, I think too, it's, it's opened some doors where we've been contacted to submit some nominations in other areas outside of food around sustainability and environmental sector. So I think that when education is a component of your tour, you know, it also opens up um, other sectors to, you know, be interested in your business as well. And I think too, that because my husband and I do collect all of this research over the last, um, it's almost three years now we've collected this research and information and kind of serve as this nexus point, uh, then we do get contacted to communicate those learnings that we've heard from farms and fishers um, and different you know, NGOs uh, around food sustainability. And that could be at higher education institutions, podcasts, panels, um, but that's kind of another aspect. So I know I've got about five minutes left, so I thought I would get into a, just a couple more topics. I know sometimes people have questions on the nuts and bolts of a business. Uh, so I wanted to first talk about staffing. So in year one, uh, it was just uh, myself and my husband. Uh, my husband led all the tours um, and really was the lead with all of the nonprofit organizations and all of the uh, farms and fisheries, and I really worked on more kind of the business, business side and the partnerships with the restaurants. Um, in addition to the two of us, we hired that branding firm, as I mentioned, engaged in a contract uh, agreement with a PR professional, and of course we had an accountant. Um, in year two, last year, 2019, we added on someone to help us with social media and we hired our first guide. Um, he is a dean at a local school, so he's available on the weekends and in the summer and he has been fantastic. Um, and then this year in 2020, we added on a business consultant to really help us think, you know, how we would need to scale this in the next five years in terms of, you know, financial vi viability and to look at our margins, our revenue expenses, um, and just some overall consulting. My husband and I being a husband and wife team, it is nice to have a third party person give us different ways to think through things or help us work through different, you know, issues that we're facing with our business. Um, and we'd also found four uh, guides that we had made employment offers to that we were really excited about and have obviously had to table that in light of our tours not being able to operate right now um, with COVID-19. Um, 
and so next in terms of our tour offerings, uh, in year one, we did a shorter season, uh, June through December. We did our signature tour five days a week, 11 to two. Um, in year two last year, we operated March through December and added a new tour, uh, again, five days a week that um, was about 2.30 to five. And again, that was just four stops and four drink pairings that brought in agricultural products like vodka made from Maine potatoes and our main craft brewing scene, because we were definitely hearing from people wanting to do uh, some drink pairings as well with their tour. And this year we were poised to kind of transition that afternoon tour to a new tour that we have researched on Maine food past, present, and future. And so we were really excited about that. And we've had a lot of interest in that tour. And again, pairing that with drink pairings as a late offering and still keeping our signature Land Sea to Fork tour um, from 11 to 2. And we were poised to start a new tour this summer, which we were going to for lack of a better word, call it a source tour, where we're gonna get people out of our historic Old Port area in Portland and have them travel a little bit farther north to see more of Maine and actually go to producers, cheese producers, oyster farmers, um, you know, restaurants that are a little bit farther north. Uh, and so we were set to do that um, and also really expand our uh, private event offerings uh, to businesses as well. I think that's something that businesses have seen the value in us and we really wanted to expand that of that all businesses need to adapt and I think showing the adaptability of heritage industries like agriculture and commercial fishing are very applicable no matter what sector you're in um, people also employed in kind of Maine's food super cluster and the traded industry cluster are is our second largest industry cluster in Maine. So it's also really important, I think, that you get to walk away understanding that sector and you get to have amazing food, uh, you know, really learn something during that. Um, obviously, we we've, we've are gonna probably table our source tour and maybe not have as many private events in light of when people start coming back for travel. So we're probably gonna stay focused this year on our land, seat of fork and past, present, future tour. Um, I've talked about the positives of this model, but there are definitely challenges. Um, the first challenge is in hiring guides. Um, it's a lot of content uh, to memorize um, and getting familiar with that content. We certainly allow guides to share you know, their own experiences and bring um, you know, their own flair to the tour, but you know, the, really the value proposition of our tour is that educational content. So we really need to make sure that at each stop uh, that information is being conveyed. So that takes uh, a unique person to find, um, to serve as a guide. Um, the second challenge is restaurant partners. You know, we're, <laughs> we're in a bit of a niche uh, tour here where we're looking for restaurants that source local sustainable food. Uh, as a byproduct, they tend to be a restaurant that's of a certain caliber that already has quite a following. And so, you know, really convincing them to see the value of being a partner on this tour. Um, also, our tastings really reveal the educational content. So it's making sure that let's say we have a gap on the tour that we're looking to fill around a stop that would serve a sustainable seafood or would serve lobster or an agricultural product. We also need to make sure that that restaurant, um, you know, that that's something that, you know, really also highlights, uh, you know, their talents, their capability as a restaurant as well. And then of course, all of that needs to be in a walking distance of about a mile, which is how long our tours are. So that can be a challenge. And then the third challenge, as I mentioned, is that we're a state of 1.3 million, but have 37 million visitors. So two thirds of our guests are from out of state. Um, and we really need to figure out more how to tap into that local market uh, to take our tour and, and, and see the value of learning about the state. And certainly in light of COVID-19 with um, probably the local traveler coming back um, first, uh, you know, we really need to, to make sure that we um, do some pivoting in that. And so on that note, I kind of just wanted to conclude with this topic. I know that all of us on this call are struggling during these unprecedented times. Um, 
I, I know for us as a tour company, just so many things you couldn't plan for, you know, all the pre-sales that were made in, in January and February and that that really was unearned revenue and how to plan for that in the future with needing to do, um, you know, significant refunds um, sort of all at the same time. Some people were willing to convert to gift cards, but some people, you know, were only coming into the area based on a cruise, based on um, a business having a meeting and just didn't feel comfortable transferring that into um, a gift card. And we haven't really had much in the term in the way of sales in the last few weeks as people are kind of waiting to see where all of this goes. And I think just not sure when the season will begin, when it will return to 2019 numbers. Um, so I think for us, you know, we're trying to figure out, you know, what's the best way to, you know, spend this time. I agree with Eric that it's all about planning, uh, but really we've just taken the approach first to shining a light on all of our partners, any way that we can use social media to again, kind of showcase our restaurant partners with their doors shuttered, showcase uh, those individual folks um, that are farmers and fishers and food producers that you can't see a shuttered door and the help that they need to move their product at this time that likely was going to a lot of restaurants and how as a community we could support purchasing um, those items and also our nonprofit and research organizations. Um, and, you know, I think that we've thought about different things we could do with the educational component of our business. We'd like to do one short video of kind of the state of Maine's food system right now. What what made what what are people passionate about in terms of main food from both restaurants producers and nonprofits that work uh, on sustainable food systems um how covid 19 has affected them and you know kind of their their hopes for the future and how people can support them so we're looking to do that and maybe even take the educational aspect into some type of conversation that people could engage with us on in a in a virtual way um, I, I heard from some other food tour operators on a call. They're having some success with this kind of food tour in a box. They work with a lot of markets of specialty uh, produced food and they're, and they're sending that around and that's working for them. But I think my best advice is just, you have to think of your own business model and, and you know, what works best for you. And I think that um, the best advice I was given during this time is to focus on two things, which is, patience and innovation. And so I am grateful that this summit is coming at this time. I want to thank all of you for attending this session and I look forward to attending the sessions throughout this and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. Very insightful. Really appreciate your, your wisdom. You definitely know what you're doing. <laughs> um, there are some logistical questions to start with. Uh, first of all, are your tours all walking or are there any vehicles involved? So our tours to date have all been walking. Um, they are all uh, pretty close to a mile in length, um, but we were looking to launch uh, that source tour this year where we would have picked people up in a vehicle um, in the heart of our old port downtown district and then take people north to producers and other farms. Okay. And what are the min minimum and maximum number of guests on your tours? So the maximum right now is 14. Uh, the minimum, we don't like to operate without a group uh, smaller than four. four. Okay, but I imagine you would probably do a custom group of two if they paid for it. Yeah, that's something too we're looking to move into with, with just my husband and I running the business. We sort of had this model, but we're now starting to get inquiries of how can you know, you put together a tour to take, you know, two to five people. So we're kind of starting to move into that as well. And are your tours seasonal or are they year round? Uh, so they're March through December right now. And we might look at something next year where we do something in our off season, but we personally really like to take January and February. There's a lot of connecting we want to do to our farms, fisheries, nonprofit organizations, put together our new tours for next year. So for us, we found that those two months, there's a lot of snow in Maine during those two months. And so it's sometimes good for us to take that time to innovate and recalibrate our business. 
So the next question has to do with kids and families. Um, can children participate in the tours and are children a, an interesting market segment of clients for you? Yeah, that's interesting. We, um, you know, we've done some pro bono donations to school groups, um, both public schools, um, those in a food writing camp, who I would say are at least 10 or 11 years of age. And so we've tailored when we do those to uh, be more focused on kids being able to consume the content. In terms of our public tours, we do really say that this is a bit more of an adult experience and that it's really more for you know 10 or 11 and above. Um, our daughter is 11. She's taken it multiple times with her friends but um, you know we want to be clear on that it's almost three hours and there's a lot of there's a lot of educational component to it and the socialization is really more on the walks and some of the questions so we try to be upfront on that. And I also imagine that in some... But that being said, but that being said, that's a really good question because we started to talk about, you know, with food tours, you're relying a lot on people buying tickets. And could there be a more sustainable product for us, even in the off season, of taking this educational content and providing it, you know, maybe at the middle school, high school, college level um, and deliver that content in a, in a different way. So we thought about that. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, one thing I think people need to think about as well is not all venues will allow children. There may be local laws that prevent people under drinking age to come in. Do you have that in Maine? No, so we do go to, um, or we did go to one restaurant and we're going to go to their sister restaurant that is definitely more of a bar situation but they have a back room that they're allowing us in and so they don't we don't have the law where a, a child can't come in there so okay oregon does do yeah yeah they won't allow even if it's with parents the kids can't come in yeah Let's see um can you share some tips or advice for creating new relationships with your local stakeholders sure um i really think that it's about showing that this is just another opportunity to really gain um, exposure. You know, as I, as I said before, if you're a restaurant, you know, really the value is we're going to come in there. We're going to talk about everything that you're doing, that you're going beyond your bottom line to source local sustainable food. You're going to see our script content. Yes, we're going to talk about your restaurant, but we're going to talk about something bigger too in the food system and to be attached to that. And I think that, you know, people want, to, if you're in this sector of food, I think you do have this secondary um, interest of, you want to educate people. You want to feel like you're part of elevating why this sector is, is so critical for so many aspects. And I think that farmers and growers, we don't ask anything of them, but to maybe allow us to have a meeting with them. And then we promote them on social media. We have links on our website where you can go check out their entity, their farm shares. And the same thing with nonprofits and organizations, education is an arm of, of all of them. And I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's just another way that we're helping to, you know, bring attention to their mission or, or their restaurant. So I would just encourage, again, the model we set up was that we weren't going to do this unless we supported that whole supply chain. So we really made sure that we went out and, um, I mean, we've met with all of, all of our partners. So that's key and to keep going and meeting with them once a year. And when they have events, they send it to us. We promote that, you know, it's, it's another way to, to help them out in that aspect, so. Do you plan on redesigning any of your tours based on new health and safety concerns? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So um, again, I think one thing we're thinking about in the interim is that maybe we could do a product that could be main food for thought conversations, like a pretty low cost point, maybe 25 US dollars, something even lower than that, um, where it would be live sessions where we could bring in some of our producers, which we're not able to do on the tour, um, to answer some questions. And I think what we would do is not tie it to, you know, they need to have lobster to take the tour, but that they would buy something local to their community to be able to eat during the tour, to share what they're eating that's of their community. So I think in the short term, we're looking to pivot that. 
Um, but I definitely see coming down the road that we're going to have to figure out at least the way I look at 2020 is that I don't see personally a return to any type of normal. I don't see us being able to have 14 people together on a tour. I could be wrong, but I think that when restaurants are able to open up, I think there's going to be social distancing in place of how many people can be at each tour. And I think that we're going to have to likely decrease the capacity and figure out how to sit people even with people that they come with um, at a table. Like I saw in the state of Colorado, I saw when they're op going to open up their um, restaurants, they're going to do something when they start to allow you to, maybe it wasn't Colorado, maybe it was a Southern state. I'm not sure, but it was, um, you know, you need to sit with your family at a table, you know, it's like you're reducing like the exposure. And I'm wondering what these social distancing, you know, requirements will come in, but we'll have to pivot. But I, I do really like the statement at the start of this summit, Eric, that you said is that, you know, food is something that's always had really strict, you know, health and safety codes and we're going to do the very best we can to keep people safe. There's a lot of walking on our tours. Um, half of our restaurants we're at when they're not open. That's another great selling point is that it's just going to be that tour group in the business for half of our stops. Okay, um, we have a lot of questions and not so much time to ask them in, so we're going to go fast here. Um, how did you select your partners and suppliers at the start and do they approach you now directly now that you are more established? So we have on our website a, a form that if you'd like to partner with us, you can fill that out based on whatever entity. So we have definitely received inquiries through that. Um, as I mentioned, we, we partner with restaurants that commit to source local sustainable food that are able to provide a tasting that would illuminate the education. And again, that were restaurants that were really considered world-class on the map that people wanted to visit without knowing us as a brand. Um, we'll always, just go with restaurants that are sourcing local sustainable food and tell that education. And in terms of the farms and fisheries, we really highlight the ones in, our, in the state that are providing to our restaurant partners and those tastings. Um, honestly, Maine is a smaller state. A lot of those producers are the ones that are the main players regardless. I mean, they're very small scale. Um, but they source to a lot of different restaurant partners. So that's a way that we do that. Of course, through social media, we'll, we'll, we'll promote any farm and, and fishery, you know, that that's helping, you know, to further, you know, main sustainability. But that's really how we partner with partners is through that lens. And then nonprofit organizations, those are really those that span the whole food economy through food insecurity to organic farmers to Maine Farmland Trust to the Maine Lobstermen Association. We want to have that whole spectrum. Uh, and all political views on the spectrum related to that, you know, that we might have a Gulf of Maine Research Institute that has one view on sustainable seafood. We might have a Maine Fishermen's Association with a different, we try to bring both those perspectives to the tour. Okay. Uh, the next few questions have to do with um, locals, and I'm going to combine three questions into one because they're kind of related. And this also needs to be our last question, unfortunately, and there's still unanswered questions. So what we're suggesting is that people could get in touch with you um, next week when we send out the key takeaways to everyone attending today. Your email address will be included. So Sarah, would you be open to people contacting you to answer those questions? Absolutely. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, so for the last question, um, it has to do with changing your tours to suit locals' interests and knowledge. And related to that, are you having any demand to speak in any of the local schools? And how are you changing your promotions now to approach local tourism? So what I would say is that when we developed the content of the tour, I would say that this, I know I'm biased, but I would say that it's equally interesting to a local and a tourist. We have had people who are very steeped in food take the tour and this one woman said, I didn't really expect to learn anything. I worked in this. I was expecting to have some great food. I just wanted to support you. I didn't think I'd walk away learning something. I think honestly, I don't think there's much of a pivot in the content. I think it's more just getting people to be a tourist in their own community, you know, to to think, to crack that nut. I think that's applicable to to anyone, you know. I think that more the angle we've been trying to take is, look, you get a lot of visitors to Maine in the summer, okay? Some are your family, some are your friends. 
let us help you. Let us help take them off your hands for three hours. They all, everyone needs a meal, right? Everyone needs to do this and, uh, and uh, you know, learn about Maine. But I don't think there's much of the, that pivot. It's just the pivot of getting people to see the value of when I take this tour, I'm supporting these restaurants, I'm supporting these farms and fisheries, I'm supporting these nonprofits. And I think that, that we haven't put out that value proposition as much in our marketing, we haven't gone after that. So that's really something that we're going to do um, now going forward. And I, yes, we get approached by schools to take groups on our tours. And I think we wanna figure out a way to do that even in a larger type setting and develop some curriculum and have some firsthand experiences around that as well. Fantastic. Oh, that's all good stuff. Yeah, I think uh, just to kind of wrap things up here, it's important that destination marketing organizations realize that locals are tourists too, especially in bigger cities. And I will frequently uh, use examples like Los Angeles or Mexico City or London, where you can travel for two hours to get across the city to see something new and different, new restaurant, go to a new market, do a tour or, or go to a food factory or something. And just because people are local doesn't mean they're not tourists. So something to think about. Yeah, I think too, one last little sentence on that is that like, I would love to see coming out of this, that people really see hospitality and tourism as an economic driver of their region. You know, businesses, when they're expanding, attracting entrepreneurs, startups, you know, they're always showcasing what what's happening um, in that community. And I and I would just love to see that value because it's 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 significant and i don't think it gets the attention that it it deserves so wow we should put that on the poster for <laughs> for everything that we do sarah that was fantastic oh sarah for president is the comment right here sarah for president oh yeah no no thank you i <laughs> Well, I'm sure there'd be quite a few people on this call who'd be voting for you, even if they couldn't because they're not American <laughs> citizens. But I think everyone everyone who wants Sarah for president, please raise your hand. I love not it. exactly a high bar right now. Too much. <laughs> well, this is No, true. no, I'm joking. I'm non we're, we're non-political here at Maine Food for Thompson. <laughs> well, anyway. Um, so we this is it for, for now. Sarah, thank you. Uh, lots of good information. Really appreciate it. Fantastic seeing you again. And okay. in 12 minutes, we'll be beginning with the Best Green Jam, turning food and beverage products into attractions with Janice Ruddock from Canada. And there she is waving. So we'll all see you back here in about 10 minutes. So go have a cup of coffee and go to the bathroom and we'll see you soon. Thanks, everyone.